Let's so continue. we were, hello again, everybody. We were remembering ourselves, reminding ourselves uh, what we did last week. We were talking about the, the article um, mentioning the philosophy of Gordon Hampton about silence, uh, questioning this philosophy since it seems to be uh, tied to an ideology of consumerism and uh, that is for the privileged class or even not even a class actually the the happy fuse mm. um, who can afford to travel to the most uh, exclusive recluse places in the world to enjoy the most qualitative silence and um, we were opposing to that philosophy another one that was uh, following a, con uh, a contrary idea, actually. Instead of bringing people to the wildest places, bringing more wildness into the, the most uh, civilized uh, places, which is to say cities, big cities. Yeah. And we know, for having experienced a few uh, some of us, that those big cities are actually valuing their parks. Mm. Or, or we were mentioning something in New York, which can be called maybe the, the green, green belt or something like that. Okay. And there are, there's such one in, uh, in Atlanta, where oh. they, they use the, the old railroad tracks to create uh, this beautiful path through the city. Uh, and we were mentioning other things as well. What else? Well, there's, th you know Paris, um, but there's, I think it's La Petite Ceinture. Yeah, La Petite Ceinture. Which is like a, it's like a ring road, but a railroad, isn't it? Which has been left to rewild. I, mm -hmm. I read that in The Guardian and I thought, what a great thing to do. Yeah, and I think in it's a new initiative. Yeah, and also I think up in London, mm -hmm. um, what they're discovering, is that a lot of rivers mm. were blocked off artificially mm. um, and that some of these spaces could be opened up again so that the environment takes over and that the the subsoil and everything gets better so it, there, there are there are possibilities in big cities if the will if, if there's the political and social will to to make it happen so there's a bit of pressure um, and actually, given COVID, people are mm -hmm. regaining the streets. And perhaps I notice in a very micro way, mm -hmm. don't know if you've seen this, James, uh, too, but um, yeah, in Bright in Hove, where I live, yeah, you can find that people actually plant flowers mm. directly where the trees are. They'll plant flowers to make it a bit greener, mm -hmm. which is just a nice aesthetic look but also it, it makes you think as if people are taking a tiny bit more of an interest. I know it's not the subject, but it's just to say, I think there's a sensibility to the subject. Well, it's linked because you remember one of the point that the article was trying to make is when you care for silence, you care for many other things yeah. that are eco um, linked to ecology. Danny, sorry, sorry, new... Antoine, you've got to know. Hi, hiya, Danny, it's Scott, you all right? Yeah, hello, Scott. Yeah, welcome to the group. Yeah, I'm just trying to find out how to... Um, You're in it? Yeah, I know. I'm just trying to make the page bigger. I don't think at this point you're not going to be able to. You're just on the side of a page. And um, Antoine up at the top there. I'm oh, sharing hello. the screen. Hello. Okay, hello. You're with us. You're with us. Yeah, You're great. in it. So I um, haven't done many reading yet, but I was told on... Um, Monday, we're, we're looking at Deleuze um, in Matt's class. Mm -hmm. Good. So I thought it'd be worth checking this out. <laughs> cool. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm seeing for ages. Yeah, so uh, let's not interrupt. Okay. No problem. So we're, we were su summarizing what we did last week, going through this article, valuing silence, but in a very specific manner. Silence for the happy fuse, we could say. And we were taking a, another uh, perspective, saying that it would actually make more sense in our uh, modern uh, 
uh, age, if we question what is the specificity of today, to bring the wilderness into the big cities instead of sending uh, some civilization in the wildest places on Earth. I heard this discussed on the radio the other day. Oh, yeah. Where they were saying that they were talking about um, rewilding mm -hmm. around the, around, like, extending the idea of the green belt to other places. Mm -hmm. And then there's an alternative suggestion, yeah. which is to uh, integrate the nature in the town. Exactly. To bring the nature, so not just have a park, mm -hmm. have a, a street with maybe some grass mm -hmm. and some trees, you know. So that's one, one, one thing, one idea. It's a great idea, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And so we were questioning the importance of silence in our civilization, and we were saying that indeed we can agree with Gordon Hampton at least with one thing, which is that silence is, if we define silence the way he does, which is more natural noises and less noises from our civilization, it is something important for our minds, for our health, and it is also something which is at the core, at, um, at, uh, at the crossroad of many things. Because if you contribute to create more silence, you contribute to create um, um, better air, better uh, environments for people to play, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Everything can be linked to the quality of silence. Mm -hmm. Yet we were saying as well that our uh, kind of cities and civilization is not good in another way uh, as regards silence, which is that we have become silent people. Mm. How do you mean? In, in, which, in which way have we become uh, silent people? Perhaps well, with one another. With one another, paying less attention to each other, going less into deep discussions with one another, listening less to other people and expressing ourselves less because we are our attention and you know uh, some important philosophers of the 20th century were already warning us about uh, the fact that we may lose our capacity to be attentive to the world to the external world um, i think the uh, sorry yeah the, as, uh, yeah go ahead the average attention span has yeah. shrunk to yeah, a yeah. very People are looking at their phones, very small images on very short things on YouTube, you know, three, four minutes. Exactly. And we were uh, um, developing this idea from a text by Barth, which is uh, in a book called A Lover's Discourse. And I'm going to show it to you again. It's called No Answer in English. Who's Sack it by? You see it on the screen? Can you? Yeah, who's it by? B-A-R-T-E-H-E-S. -E no Lombard. That's the yeah. one. Right. So it's in a book called A Lover's Discourse, and this fragment is specifically on silence. But not silence as something you would value for the benefits it has on our minds, on our health, and on our society, but the very opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. And let's put ourselves in the situation again. Mm -hmm. I am in love with someone and I notice that I, when I'm speaking to that person to impress them, they seem to be elsewhere. They seem to pay attention to other things around. So the communication seems to fail in some way, even though I'm attempting there is a lack of attention which results in a bad resonance, a lack of resonance. Let's read this passage again. One, 
Can you make it? Can, can you make it any bigger? Of course. Oh, great! Thanks. Big enough for one more time. That's fine. Yeah. Scott, and it's all you... yours from number one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to start? Well, do you want me to read it out loud? Sorry. Yeah, please. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, when we were talking to him, discussing any subject at all, X frequently seemed to be looking away, listening to something else. He broke off discouraged. He broke off discouraged. After a long silence, X would say, go on, I'm listening to you. Then you resumed as best you could. The thread of a story in which you no longer believed. To continue? Yes. Yeah. Can you scroll it? Um, uh, no, it's uh, if you want, but it's this passage here. Like a bad like console. a bad yes, better. Like a like a bad console, effective space contains dead spots where the sound fails to circulate. The perfect interlocutor, the friend, is he not the one is he not the one who constructs around you the greatest possible resonance? Cannot friendship be defined as a space with total sonority? Wonderful, thank you. So that's enough to let us understand uh, what I was trying to um, to show or to uh, better understand maybe, is that I think this situation that is described here by Bart is not specific to the amorous kind. It can be enlarged to many people, especially in our societies. Because as we try, when we try, and are we still trying, I don't know, to communicate more about what we really feel and how we really feel, it's rare that we find total sonority. It's rare, rare that we find the kind of friendship that establishes a true resonance. Because people have lost this ability to pay attention to what other people say and to care for this kind of interactions. Excuse me, I just got to check my phone. Of course. Ah, that's a joke. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So you see, maybe, maybe uh, it seems subjective what I'm saying, but you know, there are many studies on that, on the, as you were saying, Daniel, the lack of attention, the, the screen, uh, how, do you, how did you put it? The, oh, people looking at small screens, uh, very the short. Shrinking, the shrinking. Very short videos on YouTube. Yeah. Of cat, cats or something. Yeah, very yeah. Short, short videos and they're on small screens and people flit, I think, from one thing to another very rapidly. And it is also something that was noticed by this filmmaker named Godard. Yeah, I've just I put, posted a uh, clip from, uh, I think, was it Abu de Souf? Uh, yeah. Oh, and no, sorry, it's two or three things I know about her. Well, that's the film about Paris. That's yeah. right, yeah. I posted a clip up of it recently, and I think people liked it. And so what Goda uh, uh, was saying already 40 years ago, I think in an interview uh, that he made of Woody Allen, he was very uh, daring to ask this question. Uh, he was talking about one of uh, the best Woody Allen's films at the time. I don't remember which one it is. One, uh, I think it's Annie Hall. Maybe, I think so too. And, uh, and he was asking if he had been influenced in his filmmaking by TV. And that was a question which was at the same time a form of criticism. And what he meant by that, and what he meant many times, is that the style of films that we're making nowadays is taking into account this small attention span that we have and playing with it. So you notice that the scenes are made to um, to be very exciting all the time with cuts. Uh, it, you, you, have an, you have an image 
uh, and then it cuts and something else and the movement of camera all the time. It, the camera is never still. And uh, if you see a trailer for any kind of movie, not even an action movie, it's, go it's going to be like that. Could you, uh, there, was, there was an article in The Guardian, um, I believe yesterday with Matthew Damon. Yeah, Matt Damon. Matt Damon, who yeah. we see it, who was exceptionally, he, he was a very big Hollywood star in the eighties with films like Rumblefish and stuff like that. And he, he came out with an interesting sentence, I, I thought, in that he just termed Hollywood, he said that their films weren't so much open for interpretation and it said a lot, as if along the lines that you're saying, it was more about the action. And he mm -hmm. said that he preferred now to go with European filmmakers because the style, the style of movies could actually be open to discussion and that there might be more than one viewpoint on things. So perhaps he's learned his craft and he wants to be more expressive. I yeah. don't know. And if you're watching alternative cinema, uh, cinema d'auteur, uh, except if by cinema d'auteur you, you mean uh, uh, people such as uh, the Hollywood uh, most famous directors who are in some ways auteur, uh, such as Christopher Nolan, but if you, by cinema d'auteur, you mean some kind of more um, uh, movies with a, a smaller budget and therefore that can take the risk to have uh, a few, uh, uh, how, do you, how do you say? Independent uh, films. Yeah, independent films that, that make less money. They, they can take the risk to ma make you uh, experience something okay. different that you might actually reject because it's not what you were looking for. Mm. Goddard said uh, a film should have a beginning, a middle and an end, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, movies by uh, such directors as Carl Theodor Dreyer. He, yeah. he is a, um, a famous... Um, Danish, I think, uh, director, and um, what's his name? Dreyer, D R E Y E. Oh, Theodore Dreyer. Yeah, and he um, had a famous movie uh, named The Passion of jo Joan of Arc. That that Godard uses in um, in his film uh, called uh, To uh, Lives to Live, Vivre sa vie which is a film on prostitution. And you have Anna Karina who goes to this movie alone. Wow. And uh, she sees that. that, And it's, it is this image of uh, uh, a still image of uh, Joan of Arc, wow. um, uh, interpreted by, uh, I, I forgot the name of the actress, sorry. And um, she, you, you notice that she is a pure emotional body. It's a lot of emotions that are rendered by um, a disturbing music um, that seems to go through her. You know what I mean? It's not accompanying music. It's kind of a music that's in between off and in. It's as if you were actually inside or her head uh, feeling the the um, the vibes and the bad vibes actually of this mu music going through you. Um, that's an example I thought of to uh, actually uh, discuss silence again, because just gonna, just gonna get some water, but I can still hear. You. Of course, so you can be in a place of silence, such as a jail. Mm and still hear noises. You don't have to be schizophrenic to hear voices and noises, etc. go through you because our mind is made with remembrances of sounds, with uh, some, um, it's still sensitive to our ideas, etc. and our ideas 
and making noise in our mind, right? Yeah. You might remember that uh, last term I mentioned a book that was about uh, the fact that uh, novels can actually let us hear into the mind of their characters. Some, something that you um, uh, plays a large part in fiction. Yeah, in, exactly. Well, in novels and in uh, in cinema is weather. Mm -hmm. It's often used to reflect a state of, state of mind, isn't it? Exactly. So silence is also something that can be valued uh, as a state of mind, right? As you find nowadays with uh, all those practices, uh, I say nowadays, but they are old, of self-awareness, yoga, etc., to create silence inside you. But in a way, it is linked to the silence or the noises around us. You have to be a little Buddha or Dalai Lama or just a Lama, maybe, to uh, to actually create silence inside you in a very noisy place. Have, you read, the, have you read the book Walden? I haven't. Do you know about it? No. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the author. It's about an American. Um, mm -hmm. He goes, goes and lives in isolation in a rural farmhouse um, on a pond called Walden. And just spends, a, I think it's a year, two oh. years. Are you talking about uh, right. Thoreau? Thoreau? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Walden, sorry. I thought you were saying Walden with an R. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my pronunciation. Oh, no. It's not that, Danny. I think you're a bit further away than you were before. Oh. If you just get a bit closer, that might help. It's good to... Thank you. Th okay, yeah, I think maybe the... Yeah, I can okay. hear you loud and clear now. All right, great. I think the, the name of the book I was thinking of is by, so it's by Dorit Kohn, and I think in English the title is Transparent Minds. Who is it by? Dorit. Dorit Cohen. Uh, okay. Well. And uh, yeah, it seems to be Transparent Minds. So uh, you know that there was uh, a big a trend in novels, in fiction, uh, of free indirect speech, right? Indirect? And free indirect speech. It's when there is a narrator that speaks to you and in his speech incorporates uh, parts of what um, characters are thinking. And it's always, uh, not always, often uh, associated, even though it's not the same exactly, to the, the idea of stream of consciousness. So that's uh, what Dorit Kahn studies, actually the, the root of that, because the, the period of time she studies is before stream of consciousness. Which before has, Virginia Woolf. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the, the first one to uh, really create um, this kind of stream of consciousness uh, style was a French author which became, uh, which is a bit forgotten. The book is called Les Lauriers Sont Coupés. And uh, it's a really funny book to read. Does it translate? I th yeah, I think so. By Edouard Dujardin, you can even find it online for free, I'm sure. No, the trans what's it in English? Uh, let's see. It, it, uh, the laurels are cut, but I'm not sure it's actually always the translation that's chosen. Uh, I think so. I actually uh, wrote an article on translation that shows that it might not be the best translation, but it's okay. And uh, it influences Joyce uh, in his famous book, uh, Ulysses. Have you read Hunger? Sorry? Have you read Hunger? Hunger? Well, I'm not Hampson. No. I, th I think it was Norwegian. Oh, yeah? Uh, Why did you raise it, Danny? Sorry? 
you're raising a name. Is there anything that you could expand on, like with a sentence or two? Well, yeah, I'm just just about to. He, um, so it's about a, the character is he can't afford any food, so he's he's starving basically. Yeah, and um, it's all from some people say it's the first modern novel because it's his it's his exact experience of he's having mental uh, problems. Um, his, his hearing voices, he can't remember things, and it's all from a first-person viewpoint. Um, so it's, anyway, it's worth reading. Sorry, and the name of the author again? Oh, Nut, K-N-U-T, Hamson. Oh. Nut Hamson. Yeah. H-A-M-S-E-N. He was a favourite of Henry Miller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I heard of him. It's because Henry Miller in his interviews, the, the French interviews, he speak about him a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I should read that. Thank you very much for reminding us. Uh, so why am I taking this route? Because I want to talk today about a next fragment, the next fragment of uh, A Lover's Discourse, which is called Clouds. <clears throat> and we are going to read it and comment. So let's find it. I have it somewhere. Open. A machine is playing with me. Roland Barthes here so we uh, read a bit of this part uh, on silence and now clouds and the point i'm going to uh, try to make is that clouds or nuage in french could be used as the opposite of resonance you remember what uh, Rosa was proposing as the opposite of resonance, which word he was using? Alienation. Mm. Mm. And here I'm, I'm trying to see if there are not other figures that we can uh, use as uh, the opposite of resonance, such as clouds. Uh, I read the, the little paragraph under the title, meaning mm an employment of that darkening of mood, which overtakes the subject under various circumstances. Uh, James, since we okay. only hear you when you're reading, can you read? Okay. Well, whoever is kind to Frederica, the daughter of the pastor of Saint, to whom he and Charlotte- something, yeah. Okay. To whom he and Charlotte pay a visit, the face of Herr Schmidt, Frederick Rika's fiance, darkens accordingly. He refuses to take part in the conversation. Were then expatiates on bad humour. It stems from our jealousy, our vanity. It is a disconnect with ourselves. Not a disconnect, but discontent, right? Ah, sorry, discontent with ourselves, which we project on project onto others, etc. Show me the man, Werber says, who has honesty and the honour to conceal his bad humour, to endure it in solid solitude without destroying the pleasure of those around him. Such a man is obviously not to be found, for bad humour is nothing more or less than a message, unable to be obviously jealous without certain disadvantages, among which absurdity, I shift my jealousy, I produce only a derived, a distorted, indeed an incomplete effect, whose actual motive is not openly spoken, incapable of concealing the wound and not daring to declare its cause. I compromise. I botch the content without renouncing the form. The result of the transaction is temper, which offers itself to reading like the index of a sign. Here you should read that something is awry. I simply lay my pathos down on the table, reserving to myself the right to unwrap the package later, depending on the circumstances Either I reveal myself in the course of an explanation or else I swallow myself. Oh, sorry. Or else I stress myself still I further. Myself. Still further, such moves are a short circuit between the state and the sign. 
misreading were her attacks bad humour in that it weighs on those around you, yet later on he will, he himself will commit suicide, surely a heavier burden. Is a love suicide perhaps an exacerbated temper, a kind of tantrum? So I carry on? Uh, let's let's stop for now. That was okay. very good. So the, uh, it's actually a joke that Bart makes at the end. I mean, it's some. I don't know if it's a joke, uh, but it's funny that uh, uh, a love suicide is perhaps just an exacerb exacerbated temper, <laughs> a very very bad mood. <laughs> um, it's a bit dark, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. dark. Humor. Uh, any comments you have to make on that? I, I thought it was kind of interesting in the idea that by being quiet, you're, you're, you could be jealous, but that you can't show that, so you just lay down a mood. Have I yeah. missed that a bit? I, I, I thought that was, that was an, that was an interesting concept concept and also i suppose if there's if you are putting bad humor down and out um you know that it's going to affect other people exactly exactly that's the point that so so nuage here or clouds is used metaphorically right yeah to say uh, a bad humor uh, a bad mood uh, as if uh, the the clouds some clouds, metaphorical ones, are darkening uh, the, the weather inside your mind. There's something there, a dark cloud inside your mind. And you see, that's why I introduced the idea of transparent minds. And you could actually have um, a novel that explains that, explains the Oh, actually, explain is not really the word I'm looking for. The word I'm looking for so, could make you makes you experiment, make you experiment the 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 moods of its character. Wow. Whereas here, as it is not a novel which uses free and direct speech and stream of consciousness, we have characters that express things uh, as we do right now outside uh, with their mouths, right? And so show me the man, Verzer says, who has the honesty, honesty and the honor to conceal his bad humor, to endure it in solitude without destroying the pleasure of those around him. And Bart comments by saying, such a man is obviously, obviously not to be found, for bad humor is nothing more or less than a message. And you remember uh, how Bart defines himself as a... Messenger. Semiologist, someone who studies signs. And here, someone who studies what? I'm sorry. Semiologist. S E M. I know the word semiologist. I'm, I'm familiar with the term, but um, you defined it. Well, how do you define semiology? The science of signs. The science of signs. That's right. Yeah. And uh, so here, you see what Bart does is he takes something that to us usually is not understood necessarily as a sign, or actually, yes, but unconsciously. And it explains that bad humor is a sign that people send to each other. So bad humor is not... I'm not sure. Don't, uh, don't we usually try and have some kind of self-restraint in, in company? If you're in a bad mood, you don't necessarily go around swearing at the people around you, do you? Good point. Exactly. That's what is so important here. Here, nuage is not only a bad mood, is a bad mood you express. It's bad humor, not just a mood, but être de mauvaise humeur, to show that you're in a bad mood. Subtly, maybe, 
but to uh, to spoil other people's fun or other people's pleasure or other people's peace of mind, etc. So in a way, we could say that this bad mood is a noise. Even though it might be silent in terms of uh, sound, it's still a noise because even if you remain silent, you uh, disturbing other people's mo uh, happiness or etc. You you making an act, an action of meaning, right? That's why some people I don't remember who, but I think it's been said several times that when someone is being silent, they can say with an oxymoron that it's a noisy silence. I make you hear my silence tonight by being silent, right? There's For a instance. film called The Roaring Silence. Okay, interesting. It's, it's about a, uh, a, a it's Rich, Rich, Richard Attenborough, mm -hmm. um, and he's a, what they call a black leg when there's a strike. He refuses to go on strike. Oh, yeah. No one, no one will talk to him. And they call it, in this country, they call it sending someone to Coventry. Mm -hmm. Do you know this expression? No, I don't. Yes, but I, th I think it's so interesting because you're showing that uh, this social uh, behavior can actually be also a political behavior. Hmm. Well, it definitely is in this. Danny, you've suddenly frozen, or I think. Ah, you have not so frozen now. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I went too far. So but it can also be done, can't it, to, to control. It's not just an idea of spoiling someone's peace of mind or their pleasure. It's actually like thought control in a way. It's like yeah. when someone's very domineering and they want everybody around to respect their silence. Yeah, it's a form of uh, perversion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, what's your name? Antoine. Antoine. Yeah. Antoine. Okay. Um, so I think you're quite a way through this course now. I've missed a really? bit. It's okay. It doesn't matter. It's uh, I, I think it's still the beginning because I, f I feel like doing that to, till the end of my life. So it's still. The <laughs> so I should maybe. I don't know if it's worth me pointing this out. I don't want to kind of take over, you know. But um, so I'm sort of one of those people who, you know, I've dipped in and out of philosophy for years, just reading bits and pieces, and I have a real problem with what they call the continental philosophers, um, particularly the, the um, um, French postmodernists, I suppose. Um, people like Derrida and, uh, yeah. and I suppose Roland Barthes, although I'm yeah. not, really, not really familiar with his work. So, and I think the problem I usually have is I can't understand it. Well, I, I, it's actually a part, a part of why I'm teaching it is because if it was really uh, super easy to teach, to, to understand and to read, I, I wouldn't think it interesting to teach it. So I think uh, my, my understanding is that they're concerned with language. Yeah, not, um, not only, but a lot, yes. So there's a famous... You can see a famous interview, um, interview dialogue uh, on YouTube. It's on YouTube. You can find it easily. And it's uh, Jacques Derrida mm -hmm. and Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. Have you seen I, it? I, I think um, I, I know. I know actually um, uh, them uh, uh, Noam Chomsky meeting with Foucault, but I don't remember. It's Foucault. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. I'm thinking of the one with Foucault, yeah. Yeah, they, they have a very interesting uh, discussion in Holland, if I remember right. Yeah. Um, now, for me, because I'm 
first language English. Um, for me, the uh, Foucault is, has got to be mediated through a translator. So obviously I can understand Chomsky much more readily than I can with Foucault. Well, what we could do when um session is actually use this um, discussion to uh, to make one to uh, to make a session uh, that's that would be completely interesting for the theme of our class actually for the theme of this course it's okay. a very relevant uh, um, debate so something i like that chomsky says yeah else, elsewhere is that if you can't make your ideas understood to a reasonably intelligent 12 year old, then you're not communicating well. And I think he's, I think he's pointing a finger at Foucault when he says that. Um, yeah, um, I don't think, uh, I, I mean, you know, this debate uh, on whether uh, continental philosophers are too obscure and they should be uh, clearer, etc. I don't think it's that much of a good debate because if you take any field of science or, or of knowledge, if you go a bit uh, deep into that field, uh, just a little bit deep, deep, you need years of uh, of work. You know, you cannot yeah. you cannot start. It's the same with everything, with tennis or with. Uh, Oh, I understand. Uh, and so you, if you can't you take, jump in the middle, can you? Yeah, if you take the most uh, advanced philosophers, so the most advanced uh, thinkers in one field, and you expect to understand them after reading half an hour, uh, it mm. might not happen. You may understand some of it, but you may not understand most of it. Can I just interject? Sorry, Danny. No, it, you can. Could, could, Danny touched upon something which I thought was very interesting for, for me anyhow, was the idea of if English is your first language and thinking of some of these books, because I just wonder if there's a different framework of uh, constructing the human in France as it might be in Germany. They speak about, is it the Cartesian, French being Cartesian or something? So I just wonder if there's a, a different kind of scaffolding on which we build or we don't build. I mean, in England, we don't even touch on philosophy at all at school. In France, it's something that you can do, um, probably terminal, uh, going up to the actual baccalaureate, the equivalent of our A-levels, Danny. But over here in England, to do philosophy at that age, you've normally done, a, a, done some advanced reading, which a lot of us don't get to do. That's why these classes are so good. But um, I'll let you speak, Antoine, sorry. No, I think uh, those are good points. Those are good points. Uh, I, I, I can't make much of them today because uh, it doesn't really relate to what we are doing, but I, I've been thinking about them and try to, <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Let, let, let's continue with the next paragraph. And uh, so much for bad humor. A crude sign, a shameful blackmail. Yet there are sub subtler clouds. All the tenuous shadows of swift and uncertain source which pass across the relationship, changing its light and its modeling. Suddenly it is another landscape, a faint black intoxication. The cloud then is no more than this, I'm missing something. Summarily, I inventory the states of death by which Zen, uh, sorry, by which Zen has encoded human sensibility that they call Fuyu. Solitude is Sabi, the sadness which overcomes me because of the incredible naturalness of things, Wabi, nostalgia, Aware, the sentiment of strangeness, Yugen. I am, I am happy, but I am sad. Such was Melisande's cloud. Mm -hmm. So first, 
first uh, paragraph, we had a description or an analysis, if you will, of bad humor or clouds as a specific uh, clear sign. I am in a bad humor and I show it even though I might not want to acknowledge it. I'm using this bad humor in uh, the social uh, circle uh, to, to create some effects. And we, rem we remember that suicide could even be described as such an act or such an action. Sometimes people commit suicide because they want to affect other peoples who will stay alive uh, negatively. It's a form of, uh, of irrational blackmail, if you want. You didn't love me enough, you're going to regret me more. <laughs> Something like that. Mm. Um, here, in this second uh, paragraph, Bart is trying to show that there are subtleties of clouds. Oh, I, I read again, yet there are sub subtler clouds. All the tenuous shadows of swift and uncertain source which pass across the relationship. So you imagine yourself with someone and you feel many moments or instants even in the conversation or in the gathering with different lights, right? There's what we could call um, non-verbal communication that you feel through the moods. Changing its lights and its modeling, such as the modeling of the clouds in the sky, suddenly it is another landscape, a faint black intoxication. So we have this idea that comes again, but here in a subtler form of the mood intoxicating people. What's the reference to Zen? What's the difference with Zen? I don't the know. What, why does he reference? Zen? Uh, why does he reference to Zen? Because, yeah. because to Bart, uh, Zen and Japanese culture in general um, is um, the art of su subtlety, if you will. It's, uh, it's where nuance uh, is taken care of. Uh, Bart is a big uh, promoter of haikus, or haikai in the plural. Okay. Uh, and uh, to him, um, the haiku is the observation, the poetical observation of a specific instant in the present. It's the notation of the instant. So of the nuance, the specific or the singular even, nuance of that specific moment. A frog on a lily pot. Plop. Sorry? A frog on a lily pot. A frog on a lily pad. Plop. A frog on a lily pad. Plop. Exactly. Exactly. Notation of the present moment. Even, even if, you know, uh, if you take notes of this moment afterwards, it's still a no notation of the present because you, through the poem, you're living this moment again as a present. Mm. A bit like with books. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, please continue. No, I just suggest to make, take a break for now because it's been okay, one yeah. and we come back in uh, 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Time for a cup of tea. tea. See you shortly, fellas. Yeah. See you soon.
So in, uh, in the next uh, phase of the class, I will wait for Scott, but uh, I will let you know what I'm doing. I want, hello Scott again. Oh, Is yeah. everybody here? James, you here? Yes, thank you. James. Uh, yes, thank you. I hope Nia Mali is here too, if he wants to be here. And I hope others can be listening. Um, so what I propose to do for now, as um, I guess, Nobody has this book in English with him tonight or with her tonight. I was counting on Julie. She has it, but she's not here with us tonight. And so it's called Resonance. It exists in English. It's by Hartmut Rosa. And we have uh, worked on it already. And I wanted to select a specific uh, a passage to, yeah. uh, to work on, but we'll do it next week. The passage is chapter two, a chapter that's entitled Appropriation of the World and Experience of the World, Appropriation of the World and Experience of the World. And I, uh, you can read the whole chapter, of course, but we will specifically- Be posted on uh, Yes, it will. Uh, that's what I want to organize with Gilly, actually. Uh, we will try to have this very passage, which starts with the second uh, segment, which uh, second part, which is called Les Mediateurs, the mediations, I guess, of the relationship to the world, the mediations of the relationship to the world. And we will mostly focus on this second part, maybe a little bit on the third part as well, if we have time. But I think the second part should be enough. So that's what we'll be doing next week, and I will uh, do my best to have the English version uh, passage online for you. Uh, as regards tonight, I think um, we can uh, try to make a little conclusion on parts 
ideas that we've used and uh, as we have enlarged the scope of, uh, of the book. Uh, you remember that the book is about um, the different uh, positions that I am uh, uh, forced in a way to, uh, to take as I am uh, a lover, an amorous, amorous uh, person, I will have different attitudes towards the loved object or the loved one. And uh, uh, we discussed mutism, we discussed silence uh, last time and a bit tonight, which is when the other person is not responding when we communicate or we, when we and we expanded that to the idea that we find ourselves often in this situation of mutism in this world. It's, uh, it's paradoxically a very noisy world, uh, world and a very silent world as the noise is actually making communication more difficult and um, emphasizing the, the silence of communication which is really a paradox because we are living in the, the age of uh, high-speed communications, right? Mm. Mm. But we're becoming more polarized at the same time, where we're only listening to people that are like us. Exactly. And um, clouds is another uh, fragment that we can enlarge. Uh, first, by saying that, indeed, um, we may end up, if silence and noise, the bad, the bad uh, noise of civilization and the bad silence of modern societies is, uh, or are, sorry, are uh, more, more and more destroying um, our, our minds, if you will, we might end up having clouds in our minds all the time yeah, without yeah. even noticing them anymore and right. being disruptive to other people's good moments more and more. And maybe people are to us that way without even knowing that they are. Maybe they have this bad humor that they carry with them all the time or very often because they are not able to find the good silence and not able to find uh, the good uh, uh, resonance. Something I notice, I'm sure you, you notice as well, that when you walk around in the street, in the supermarket, mm -hmm. lots of people, um, lots of people, lots of people now, they've all got pl some plugged into something. They've got their headphones on or they're looking at their phone. They're not engaging in any meaningful way with their environment or the people around them. Yeah. And um, I find this annoys me. Um, but I know I'm aware that the effect it's having on me. And because I do, I practice meditation and Tai Chi and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I try, try not to let these kind of things get to me. Um, so when I become aware that Oh, someone's just walked straight in front of me, very impolite, you know, rude. But I try not to go, oh, get angry with them, because I realise they're plugged into their headphones and they're looking at their phone. But really, I think, well, stop looking at your phone and look, listen to your headphones, and look what you're doing. I nearly got run over by a learner motorcyclist a couple wow. of days ago. That, that would have headphones. been really sad. He's got his headphones on, he's not aware of, you know, it's, I think they made a law against looking at your mobile phone when you're driving. And two films by the same director, or uh, almost, that I recommend uh, to, uh, in this perspective, is one of them you might have seen, is called My Dinner with Andre, which... Uh, the oh, I've seen that, it's a great film. Uh, most, so as you know, most of the the film is just one dinner scene in which uh, they have a very deep discussion, which was unexpected by the main character, the one we follow uh, at first. 
he was just saying, I'm not sure why I'm going to this dinner. I haven't seen this friend in so long. It seems pointless. And they, it, the conversation ends up uh, changing him completely. Uh, reopening his soul somehow. And um, another film uh, which I use uh, kind of ironically is called, uh, is very famous or used to be very famous. It's supposedly by Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau. It's called The World of, of Silence. And it's the same director, Louis Mal, who worked on both. And uh, The World of Silence, which is about the sea, is uh, ironically called so because uh, they keep destroying this silence with weapons, even with dynamites sometimes. Uh, it's a horrendous movie to watch now, as uh, Gérard Mordia points out in a small video that I will uh, post. Uh, this film called The World of Silence, Le Monde du Silence, is disgustingly noisy. Because <laughs> you you actually hear how our civilization is destroying the silence. Wow. Have uh, you seen a film called Koyana Squatsy? Sorry? There's a film came out in the 1980s called Koyana Squatsy. Hmm. Can, can, you, can you maybe write that or spell it? C O Y. A N Quan C O Y A N A S Q U A T Z I. I don't think I know it. So, so we've got Koyana and then the, the surname again? Squatsy, it's all one word. Squatsy. Koyana Squatsy. Um, so it's a very good film. It begins in the deserts of Arizona, I think. And um, it's just very long, slow, steady shots, or sometimes slow pans across mm -hmm. the Grand Canyon or the mountains, the lakes, natural nature. And it's all very slow and still and quiet. And then it's about half of the film, maybe, or at least the first third. Don't tell us too much, please. Because well, I watch hang on. There's only one more bit to say. And very all of a sudden. Don't tell to... us all. We could have the surprise. Well, it's not much of it. All, all right, right, I'll let you say it, Danny, because then you you know, go on. Well, the sorry. point is, it's very well done because all of a sudden it goes into a big city, maybe as New York, and the music kicks in, the um, Philip Glass music, the famous oh, one. Okay. And uh, it kicks in really, and all of a sudden it's looking at the subway in New York and the roads and the people, and the people are running around, and the contrast. Um, I mean, it's a brilliant film. Call you on a Scotsy. Cool. Can you write that on the, on the thread? I'll, I'll post it up, yeah. Thank you. So, um, and so that was the, the point I was trying to make as well with Bart, and if we end with another point uh, gr um, dr drawing from uh, the last paragraph that we've read, which is the subtleties of the mood. I think that is um, actually a very important thing to um, care for. And Bart used to see himself as someone who was, um, who's task, and I'm using this uh, word on purpose as it is the word of our subtitle, his task was to uh, save those sub subtleties. As we were uh, going more and more towards a world that times that can, uh, tends that tends to erase them, that tends to make us uh, very grossier, very rude. not not rude, but <coughs> um, uncouth is the English uncouth, word. Uncouth. uncouth, very good word. Uh, the the very opposite of subtle, <laughs> because because we are more and more the um, 
the product of the products that we are using. The toys of our toys. And you know, there are, there are people who worked on uh, Facebook and other social networks, many things that we are using that are actually nowadays denouncing that, that we are made, uh, uh, one of them is called the social dilemma. And I'm just about to watch it. Yeah, and what they are saying is that we are, it's something that's been said by other philosophers before, uh, such as Jacques Ellul, etc. Uh, the, the philosophers of technologies, of techniques, that we are living in a world that makes us more and more the toys or the uh, the machine of the machine, if you will. They say now that you that the design, the algorithms are designed to keep you hooked, and I've noticed that because I, I was a very late uh, doctor of I didn't get the online till 2000 and 2007, seven eight something. I didn't I avoided computers for a long time. And then since I've had one, I've barely been off it, you know. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed is you go on these sites like, I don't use Facebook or any, anymore. Yeah. Well, I started, I put first got online, I used Facebook and Twitter. And then I noticed that things like YouTube, they kind of designed to keep you hooked, aren't they? You look at yeah. one thing and then it's trying to show you something else. And it's keep, you know, and if you like this, you're going to like that. Sorry? And, yeah, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. And, mm. uh, you know, for, for you know it, the day's gone and you just been... A... You may be aware as well of the fact that on Facebook, even if you don't use it, they have something that are called reactions, which are basically uh, emoticons, icons for emotions, such as the, the blue uh, thumb up. I've and seen them. There's a new one uh, with a round smiley face with a heart, which means soli solidarity. So I think there are okay. five of them. There might be, I think, five of them. <laughs> and it's actually interesting how um, that can be seen from uh, Bart's point of view, which is exactly what can be, um, what summarizes a form of reducing of our potential emotions. So let's read again, even though he's naming just a few, let's read again the, what the, the ending, uh, the end of the last paragraph. What is important to me here is not that there are, because you could argue that as on Facebook, there are just a few of them. But what is interesting is actually the fact that Bat is going towards another culture to expand his own sensitivity, to expand his own uh, uh, vocabulary on sensitivity. So imagine, imagine uh, it may happen someday that Facebook or another um, website is actually going towards other languages, Finnish, Danish, etc to uh, see if they have emotions that we haven't uh, names for in our own language. And you can find websites who do that. I will, uh, that do, do that. I will find one of them and post one of them. Uh, uh, Antoine, yeah? can I say, when, when you oh. say that, is that because Finnish could be um, a very, pictorial language and it could or be a very literal language that there could be things that are expressed because there are more words for a term or something like that is that what we mean by how facebook could then try to go into another culture to to pull to pull more well, I think one of the points I'm trying to make is that even though those icons are practical because they are, in a sense, uh, making us able to co transcommunicate, uh, you, you can be from any culture and kind of understand them, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, yet, 
we are losing something here. Yeah, okay. We're losing the subtleties and the var varieties of languages. The Tower of Babel and the fact that there are many languages is not, um, is not a bad uh, fatality. It's a good thing. It's a yeah. blessing. Yeah. And because uh, are you saying that because it, yeah. of the diversity? Yeah, the diversity. And I know nothing, uh, almost nothing about Finnish, but I know one thing maybe is that uh, such as um, b the Basque language, it is uh, a language that belongs to no other family, to no family. Yeah, yeah. I hope I'm not that wrong, but I've heard it and read it many times. Yeah, Nick, uh, from people who are serious. I think Basque and Hungarian may have a little link or something with okay. Indo, with languages that might be from the Far East. There's a little, it's a little kind of connection. Uh, so uh, the point that I'm trying to make finally is to say that uh, instead of uh, impoverishing uh, or um, silent moods, we can actually uh, enrich our vocabulary to express them. And to, even if the moods remain silent, to have something to express this silence. And maybe communicate the, with a friend, like uh, in a dinner with Andre, I don't know if you know Andre yeah. personally express them one day um, and um, maybe that's it oh, no one last uh, thing i want to say is that the the passage that we will work on next week uh, starts with the idea that language actually creates things mm. well, creates we, did you say pain creates the world, yeah, or paints the world and creates the world. Because what if we didn't have the word liberty, for instance? Would liberty exist in the world? Wouldn't we just invent another word for it? So that's where we're going to start next week and uh, see um, um, more about our attitudes towards the world, thanks to uh, mediations. So Can I, uh, are you close? Are you and ending the course now. Yeah, I'm ending the course uh, earlier this time. Sorry. Okay. For Can several I just, reasons. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's something I wanted to ask you before you go, because mm -hmm. on Monday you learned something, and uh, what? So we're looking at um, Deleuze. Plato and Deleuze. Yeah. And it's been a bit slow. Uh, it's, we start with spent a lot of time looking at Plato. We've only just moved on to Deleuze. And so, uh, so I actually learned something on Monday, which is always nice, isn't it? Learn something new. Yeah. And because I've tried to read uh, Jean Baudrillard in the past, and I've never finished one of his books, um, but I read one called, I read about half, of one called, uh, um, oh God, Simulacra and Simulacrum. Yeah, do you know this one? Yeah. Yeah, so, and I didn't understand it, but on Monday, um, Matt was explaining to us that Deleuze, it was Deleuze, I think, who formulated this idea of Simulacrum. Yeah, there was this, uh, this trend on uh, working uh, on the idea of simulacre um, that came from, um, I think the first who was working on that was actually Deleuze indeed. And uh, he, it's because he had worked a lot on the um, antique philosophers, which are called the Stoics. Yeah. So can you expand on that what uh, well uh, i don't know enough about the stoics really but what i do know is that it seems to me that there's that you can have um if you have an idea um so with plato there seems to be this whole idea of which i don't agree with you may not um it seems to start so socrates and plato begin 
with the idea that there are these ideal forms. You all know this because you're yeah. you know about this. So these ideal forms, how they purport quite to, to know this, I don't know. But they, there's a sort of myth. They say it's a myth, but I don't think it can be a myth because it's so much of a lays down so much of the groundwork for all the other stuff they say. So it's the myth of the cave, but they seem to suggest they've somehow seen past, seen through the illusions to the, and they talk about re, a kind of reincarnation and a reality beyond what we can experience. And yeah. they say that ev everything we only exp so as this world of pure, uh, pure forms. Yeah. And that we only, we're only seeing a sort of secondhand reproduction of that. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is kind of an idea. Um, so there's these I Anyway, it's so it's like a second-hand version. Anyway, what I thought I learned on Monday was that we can all share an idea. For example, with the Free University, um, we all know kind of what that is. FUB, come here on Thursday night, find Antoine. Maybe Scott will be here. You know, seven o'clock. Um, we all we share this common understanding. But if you, my my, uh, what I learned on Monday, I think, is uh, my the way I stated it was that you can have. So if the way I like to explain it is, if you look at a tree, yeah. and uh, a biologist will look at a tree and see a a thing, see an organism that takes in nutrient, water and nutrients and turns those into wood and chlorophyll and branches yeah. and that grows, that's what constitutes a tree to a botanist. Um, uh, and our, our, our bioculturalist or a manager of a wood look at a tree and it, how it relates to all the other trees and how he's got to keep one. A carpenter looks at a tree, sees the raw materials for making tables and chairs. Um, you know, an arsonist looks at a tree and thinks, right, I can set light to that. You know, we all, so what unites all these different views of is the idea of a tree. Yeah. So even, um, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think that's some kind of, is that what simulacrum is? Hmm. Have I got uh, this right? I would need to read uh, the texts again um, that, that are on the notion and even the concept of simulacron to have an answer for you. Uh, well, I can I ask I, you, would I be, don't mean to be rude, but if I could just ask you for, briefly what you, what is your concept of simulacra or simulacrum? How would you like to, could you express that? Scott, can you? Not... Well, actually, Scott, I'm just you... I, I, I'm just trying to take down what's already been said. I love the idea that given that the uh, society is pluralistic, that we that none of us necessarily are going to see things through this the, the same prism. It doesn't happen yeah. in politics, doesn't happen in economics. Yeah. So in and if we can have that with with subsections that we that we've designated as bodies of thought, then I'm sure that that um, is probably the same with philosophy, because you spoke about the uh, how there are these original thinkers, such as Plato, who, yeah. who, who, who can pierce through things. But I love this idea that you've just put forward, Danny, because it allows us all to see the world in a certain way. But that, yeah. that's... And I remember that we uh, came to that conclusion one day or to uh, uh, reach that point in the discussion. And I, I felt like mentioning Leibniz one day uh, with the idea of perspectivism, which is also very important for Deleuze who uh, um, uh, did his last book, uh, wrote his last book on Leibniz perspectivism. Like, um, what did you say, Leibniz? Le Leibniz, yeah, L-E-I-B-N-I-Z, sometimes with a T for the Z, and he so... He invented the calculus. 
Yeah, exactly. And so what's important to understand about Leibniz and perspectivism is that perspectivism is not the same as um, cultural relativism. Uh, it's not saying everything is equal uh, and everybody's opinion is equal and uh, you are right, uh, it's just a different point of view. The idea of the point of view when you understand it well was uh, well expressed by Daniel earlier. Is when you have um, uh, an object or an idea that you think is the same, but since everybody occupies a different position uh, in time and in space, or in space time, as Einstein would have it, and um, everybody was made <coughs> different uh, through his understanding of things uh, through his life, uh, we actually uh, see perceive things differently and differently doesn't mean that it's equal it's just different po uh, positions but some positions you on some positions you have a more uh, general view a more global view for instance a scientist understand the planet earth planet earth way better than a baby we cannot say that uh, a president who behaved like a baby uh, has uh, really the capacity to uh, to discuss um, with arguments um, with a scientist on a, on a disease such as COVID. Yeah, yeah. His, his point of view on the disease is not respectable compared to the one of the scientists. What what is Sure, though, is that there are different points of view, and we have to acknowledge that. I like it. They don't all carry equal weight, though, do they? They don't carry equal weight, exactly. Exactly. Well, so we'll have to, we'll have to get the we'll get the next instalment next week, Danny. It's just a shortened yeah. shortened one this week. Yeah. Uh, so I, I wish you a very good night. I'm sorry I'm finishing a bit soon tonight, and I hope it was enjoyable, though. No, it was. Oh, thank, you. Fun. thank you for your Actually, participation. Good to see you here next week, Danny. Yeah, nice one. Good to see you. Good to see you. Bye, yeah, good to see you. Bye James. Bye, Nimala. Bye, everybody. Bye, Bye. all. Bye.